Welcome, Blockhead Traders. Here at Blockhead Traders, I must inform you that we are not financial professionals. Nothing we say should be considered financial advice. We offer our own thoughts and opinions to you, the viewer, as a reference point. We expect you to make your own financial decisions and come to your own financial conclusions. Today is Sunday, May 30th, 2021, and this is Blockhead Traders Weekly. On this week's episode, where myself, Sprocket888, will be joined with fellow Blockhead Trader ViperXL007. In this week's episode, we're going to be starting part one of a four-part series on how to begin trading. Part one, which we're going to cover today, is going to go over the prep work needed to make sure that you're financially ready to begin your trading journey. But before we jump into this week's topic, I'd like to give a shout out to the Discord channel that we run and let you know that you can look in the description and link below and find a link to the Discord channel that we run. It's open and free to anybody that wants to join. Uh, we'd love to hear from you, say hello, um, love to answer questions and just interact with you. So check out that link and say hello to us in the Discord. In this week's episode, I mentioned we're going to talk about how to begin your trading journey and making sure that your financial house is in order to start that trading journey. But before we kind of hop into that, there's an important distinction that I want to call out here. Uh, and that is making sure that there's you understand there's a difference between trading and investing. And what we're going to be talking about today is clearly about trading and making sure that you're ready to begin that journey of trading and that adventure. Um, a couple of the key distinctions, because some people use these terms interchangeably, um, there's really three points uh, to differentiate between what's known as trading and what's known as investing. And it's real, it's gray, um, and different people might have different definitions of themselves. So this definition I'm going to give you here is, is how I interpret the difference between them. And the first point is really time frame. You know, it's it's the time frame that you're looking to be in a particular stock, equity, option, ETF, uh, any of those. Typically trading, you're in that uh, financial vehicle for minutes to maybe at most a few months. When you're investing you're looking at being in that particular vehicle, usually for at a minimum one year, but most of the time that time horizon is much longer than a year. So trading is the real quick, hey, I'm gonna do this trade, uh, I'm gonna buy this stock, I'm gonna buy this option, I'm gonna sell this option, and you're looking to enter and exit uh, in a very short time frame. For me, most of my trades tend to be uh, on the order of usually a week to about four weeks. Uh, but time frame it, to me is one of the strongest differences between trading and investing. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it's basically to me, it also, I mean, it just comes down to the time frame um, and what, what you're trying to get out of what you're doing. Um, and, and, I guess it just makes the most sense to me that that comes down to a time frame thing. Uh, if, if I'm investing in something, it's, it's more of the set it and forget it. Um, you know, I'm, I believe in the, the long direction of this particular company or whatever it is. And I'm not going to worry myself with anything short term that happens here. I'm already thinking one, two, three, four years down the line, even more, uh, you know, I mean, 10 years ago, if you were buying Apple or something in a, you know, just like, I'm just going super long with this. Um, so if it, if, if there's any more nuance brought into it, it's sort of in that mentality of what are you a trying to accomplish here? Are you trying to spin this thing? Is there a trend or something you're, is, is something hyped up that you're trying to jump on? Those generally are not investments. Uh, investments are the more stable vehicle. Um, and because that's not a lot of what we do, uh, in this channel or in these trades uh, that we publish these videos about, um, everything like Jeremy said is we're focused on the trading side of things, the faster action, um, 
and that to me, that also, that's the whole purpose of this series, that faster vehicle, that faster turnaround that is going to come with more risk potentially because you're moving things faster. And that's why it's super important to have a firm financial foundation as we're going to walk through uh, in this series. So one last thing to comment on time frame. Uh, I would kind of a, draw an analogy here uh, between the shows you might see on HGTV uh, where they're basically flipping a house, you know, flipping a house, that would be a style of trading. Uh, and then sometimes you'll see other home improvement shows, uh, this old house or, or other shows where they're restoring homes for families and they're really building the home so that family can live in it for many years to come. And that would be more of an investing vehicle. Um, just a, just an analogy there. One of the other points that I want to call out here, which I feel is a very key distinction between trading and investing, is the type of indicators that you're going to use uh, to, cho to show you when do you enter an uh, order and when do you exit an order, and what type of pre-investigation uh, due diligence do you actually do. In trading, typically, uh, you're going to be using technical analysis uh, for the actual thesis on what you think is going to happen. And you're also going to be using technical analysis uh, for your entry point into that uh, order. And when I talk about technical analysis, this is really the analysis of price action. This is the analysis of sentiment. This is the analysis of basically everything that's not the fundamentals of the company. Uh, that other type of analysis, which is called fundamental analysis, this is when you're looking at uh, the company's financial reporting uh, at a quarterly basis. What do their books look like? Uh, what does the business uh, environment look like for their company, their corporation? How are they positioned with in comparison to their competitors? What's their product line that's coming up? Um, typically, when you're looking at investing something, you're often going to use fundamental analysis to choose your your investment thesis. You know, you're going to say, "I like company X because I've really looked at their books. They keep a good record. Uh, this, that, and the other." You're going to use a lot of those fundamental indicators to choose what you want to spend your money on. And then you will typically rely on technical indicators to find out what a good entry point is. So you'd be basically kind of assessing the company, saying this is definitely a company that I want to invest in, uh, but you're going to look for the best entry point into that investment. And that's when you might rely on technical indicators. So like I mentioned, um, technical indicator or the types of indicators that are used also are closely related to the type of strategy that is being deployed. Yeah. Um, it, and it's interesting to me how these indicators are intermixed um, because, you know, like, like Jeremy mentioned uh, price action or price levels, even um, just because you want to go long on something doesn't mean you don't want a good deal on it. Um, so you're going to, you're going to pick out, what you're investing in, but you are still going to use some of the techniques that we talk about more regularly to get your best price. Um, but then emotionally you're detaching from it because you're going very long with it. Um, you know, you're, you're, if it spikes, you don't care. You're looking longer than that. Um, but that doesn't mean you, you shouldn't get a good price to buy in at. And that's where you would, you would overlap some of those indicators. Yeah, absolutely. And then the last bullet point that I'd like to call out here, which is typically a, a key driving factor in the difference between trading and investing, is I'm going to call it stability. You, you could also probably replace this word with uh, volatility, um, things like that. So when you're trading, you're looking for quick movements. You're focusing on binary events, earnings, your uh, product announcement, uh, upcoming drug trial. Uh, anything that's going to kind of swing the stock one way or another for a brief moment in time, you know, a couple of days, maybe a week, two weeks, um, you're, you're trying to hop onto that trend wagon. Um, 
volatility is is kind of interchangeable here because usually if you're going to be trading something, uh, you're not going to have it for very long. And so you're going to want larger swings in the price. Uh, and that typically comes with volatility. Whereas investing is really long term. This is one year, two year, 10 years, 20 years. And so the the small fluctuations of up 5% down 6% in you know a month's time frame really don't matter that much when you start weighing you know well where is this thing going to go in 5 years you know how much return are we going to see on this in that long period and so you're less concerned about those initial uh turbulent times and you're more focused on the longer period which kind of goes back to the first point of time frame yeah i definitely link Time frame and stability, uh, very closely, very closely related. Um, drilling, I mean, I guess as another as another attempt at analogy or comparison, um, you know, I mean, we've briefly talked about day trading. Uh, so even within the trading realm, um, day trading, and you know, weeks or months trading, you know, could almost be a similar comparison to trading in general versus investments because on day trading, like, I mean, you're living on the one minute candle, uh, or the five second candle, like you're striking on these tiny little moves. You don't care about the macro environment, um, zoom out trading the larger plays. You know, you're, you're not worried about that, that, that micro scale, uh, you're focusing a little larger. And then, I mean, the way that plays into stability is obviously, uh, investments, you, you might not stomach a wild volatility of something because, uh, it's obviously not stabilized. I mean, you're, you, you want something that has potentially has a little bit more of that stability or is a little less susceptible to, uh, wild swings. So that wraps up the different points in trading versus investing. And that's important to call out because what this video is really about is it's about learning how to trade and are you ready to basically become a trader and what steps do you need to take to become a trader? And really one of the first things that you need to look at is are you in a financial position that's ready to take on the trading tasks and going on that trading adventure? And so the next stuff isn't always that exciting or glamorous to talk about, uh, but it is a very important foundation to have to make sure that your financial house is in order such that you are ready to take on a lot of the risks that come with trading. There's a lot of benefits that can come with it, but there are certainly a lot of risks that can also come with it. And you owe it to yourself to basically make sure you consider these things to help you answer, are you financially ready to trade? And the first point that I would say is, do you have a budget? So budgets come in all different shapes and sizes. Uh, people do budgets uh, very differently, um, you know, budgeting down to the penny or, or, or nickels and dimes that they spend on groceries every month. Uh, to me, uh, what's needed here to be financially ready to trade is do, have you considered all of your monthly expenses? Have you considered your monthly income um, from whatever it is, your salary, uh, your hourly side job, um, all the different things, all the money coming into your household? And then are you setting aside the money for your rent? Are you setting aside the money for your mortgage? Do you, are you consistent in your discipline for, you know, your utility bills? Are you consistent in, you know, your cable bill, your phone bill, your, your grocery bill? Do you have an allocated percentage of all of that take home income, uh, allocated in to each of these necessary expenses? You know, if you do, that's great. That's the first step in kind of getting ready for this trading journey is to make sure that all of your bases are covered and funded uh, by your monthly income that you get from your, your job, your earned income. 
You know, if you're the type of person that says, yeah, I got a, I got a budget, you know, I, I get my paycheck, I, I put it in my bank account, um, you know, I, I pay whatever's on my credit card bill. And, you know, if I have some money left over, then, then I might go out to dinner, um, you know, and, and, and whatever's left over that, then yeah, sure. I, I have that to trade. Um, that's not really what I would consider a budget. A budget is actually thought out um, and kind of allocated on a monthly basis. And, and you kind of check yourself. It says, hey, I'm going to tell myself I'm going to spend, you know, $500 in groceries this month. And do you, do you check that every month? Do you see how much over or under you are? Um, do you adjust? Is, is, your, is your numbers realistic here? And being able to budget is a very big key part in showing that you are truly ready to take that next step into trading. Yeah, for sure. It, uh, you know, and, and, and like you, like you touched on, there's, there's such a wide array of budgets you can have. I mean, you know, you could be very tightly monitored, very tightly budgeted. Um, that certainly doesn't hurt. It certainly helps. Um, but the key takeaway here is, are you already thinking in terms of pie and how much of a pie is going to the different areas of your life and ensuring that if one slice gets too big, what happened? You know, you have, you have it worked out in your head of how to compensate for that. Um, and you, you're able to stick to all of that because, that 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 plays forward not only does that help you fund your investment account or your trading account um but you're going to come back to that methodology over and over and over and we'll talk about that a little bit later um but it it's going discipline is huge to not run away with because everything whether it's oh yeah I got some extra money I'm going to go out to eat that translates one to one in the trading world of oops that gave me a little bit more money than i expected i'm just going to go like you could if you feed the same cycle if you don't stick to what what you're doing and what you've budgeted for yourself um and we'll definitely get more into a, into some of that stuff a little later on here yes so that point is all about are you taking care of your necessary expenses and you are living within your earned income range, taking care of your ne necessary expenses. And, and now, you know, you don't take your surplus and go straight to trading. There's a couple of things that you really should be considering uh, in doing before you even open that first trading account. And the first one that I call out here is, I'd say, are you maxing out contributions to an IRA? So an IRA is an individual retirement account. Um, everybody is eligible to have one. I I personally believe that everybody should have one. And, you know, there's a limit to how much money you can put in these IRAs on an annual basis. Uh, I believe currently uh, for most people in 2021, that limit is about $6,000 per person over a year. And, you know, there's two different types of IRAs, and we're not going to go into the great detail of, of the differences in the IRAs, uh, but you might hear of a Roth IRA or a traditional IRA. I would encourage you to Google both of these and learn about each of these types. Um, a lot of times the Roth IRA is the type of um, IRA that people will contribute to early in their career. Uh, once you reach a certain income level, uh, you're not eligible to actually contribute uh, with deductions and stuff like that to an uh, Roth IRA. Uh, typically, the Roth IRA, the contributions are made uh, post-tax so that your withdrawals and distributions from a Roth IRA are actually tax-free. Um, a traditional IRA, you basically make contributions pre-tax and then the distributions you take in retirement coming out of the account are then taxed at the income rate at that time. Uh, so a lot of people feel like Roth IRAs are more advantageous because you don't know what the tax situation is going to be, you know, 20, 30, 40 years from now when you're making distributions. So, uh, and once your income increases to a certain level, you're not actually even eligible to make contrib excuse me, to make contributions into a Roth IRA. So the key point here is that $6,000 is not 
it can be a large amount, but in the grand scheme of things, it's not that much. And so you really should be considering as part of that budget to make the maximum contribution into an IRA every year because that 6000 over 20, 30 years can really balloon into a much, much bigger number. So similar to an IRA is what's known as a 401k. And now not everybody has a 401k. Some people, uh, some employers don't offer them. Uh, for those of you that do have a 401k through your employer, you may or may not have employee matching contributions. Now, the amount of money that you can contribute to a 401k in a year is quite large. Um, offhand, I don't remember the exact number uh, for 2021, but it's somewhere on the order of maybe $22,000, uh, something to that effect. It's, it's quite large. And so, you know, it's not really that important to max out your contributions to a 401k because that would be very a large chunk of your income. But on many employers that offer a 401k, they will offer employee or employer matches to your contributions. And they look very different. Um, you know, some employers will match you dollar for dollar for, say, the first 2% that you contribute to a 401k. Uh, some might match 50 cents on the dollar for the first, say, 6%. And what I would say is, you should strive to, at a minimum, contribute to a 401k all the way up to where your employer stops matching. The reason is because it's free money. So if your employer says, I'm going to give you a 50 cents for every dollar that you contribute up to 4%, if you contribute 4%, you're going to earn an extra $2 for every contribution you get, 50 cents on the dollar, $4, 4%, extra $2 that you just go into your retirement account. And so always check into your employer's 401k and max out the contribution to match your employer's match. And don't get too hung up about whether or not they have lots of good options in a 401k with the provider or not. You can always roll money out of a 401k and into an IRA. Something else for you to Google. We're not going to get into the specifics of that today. The key point here is that you really need to be saving and for your future. And these type of accounts, IRA, 401k, these are all investment accounts. Okay, this is where you're going to be picking investments, ETFs, mutual funds, um, you know, uh, long-term stock plans, things like that. And also along the lines of um, the next one is, do you have kids? Do you, uh, do you think they might go to college someday? Um, do you have a savings plan to account for the college trip, the, the college expenses that your, your children might encounter? You know, maybe you yourself have a college aspiration, a higher degree, maybe a bachelor's degree, maybe a master's, a doctorate. Um, you really should be saving uh, for those college expenses early on. The earlier you save, the less money you have to contribute every month and every you know year, within a year, uh, to build these vehicles up such that they will benefit you appropriately when it's time to utilize them. You know, I'm not going to go into all the different various uh, savings vehicles that you can choose from. Uh, you can Google a lot of these, uh, but some of the things are a 529 plan. That that would be a college savings plan. Uh, you could set up a trust for, for your child or your kids or uh, any other minor to, to contribute money into it uh, to help fund for college. Um, there's also what's known as a UGMA and a UTMA account. They're kind of used interchangeable. Uh, it stands for Universal Gift to Minors Act or Universal Transfer to Minors Act. Uh, these are uh, savings vehicles where you can contribute money to, and there are some tax benefits to it, but that money becomes uh, money that your child can use once they become uh, of a certain age, depending on your state, 18, 21, uh, in that, in that realm. And those funds can be used to, uh, 
be spent on higher education. So all of these are back to that slice of the pie that we referenced earlier. You know, okay, I've got all my expenses taken care of to make sure that my lights are on, my, there's food on my table, um, you know, but this is also, am I saving for my own retirement? Am I making sure that I'm setting money aside for college expenses? Uh, things like that. The next point is, do you have a health savings account or an HSA? So again, not everybody is eligible for opening an HSA. Um, you kind of, it depends on, do you have a high deductible in health insurance plan? Um, and you can think of a health savings account very much like a 401k for healthcare expenses. So if there's one thing that's constant, healthcare costs in the U.S. are only really ever going up. That's all they ever have done historically. They're forecasted to continue going up. Um, and so you might be saving money for your retirement through your IRA, your 401k, but you can also set money aside um, in case you're maxing out all these other vehicles. You can actually set other money aside specifically for health account or health expenses. And that's in the form of an HSA. And, and most HSAs, you know, you can open up um, anywhere, really. Uh, all kinds of brokerage accounts will, will kind of offer them in some places. Um, there are special banks out there that offer HSAs. Uh, some of them have hand-selected investments, kind of like a 401k that your company might offer. Uh, other ones basically just let you kind of trade in the stock market. Uh, for example, I have a health savings account, and a chunk of that health savings account is managed at uh, my brokerage, TD Ameritrade, and it's literally a trading account. I can buy any sort of mutual fund, ETF, stock option, bond, uh, you name it. If it's traded on, on, on TD Ameritrade, I can trade it in my health savings account, and that lets me choose investments um, from a, a huge arena. And the goal here is, you know, who knows what kind of health expenses I'm going to have when I'm older. So I might as well start saving for them now because that would be money that I don't have to pull out of my uh, IRA or 401k planning for the future. A and lastly, um, you know, once you've already kind of done all this other uh, planning and forecasting for things that might happen, you know, when you retire, the healthcare expenses, uh, higher education expenses. The last thing I'm going to call it a rainy day fund, you know, and this is a fund that, that you hope never to really have to use. Um, but you know, this is a fund that basically says, look, if all of a sudden my monthly income disappeared, you know, because I lost my job, um, company downsized, uh, a global pandemic came by and shut everything off. Um, who, who knows what it might be? It's what is the money that you have in your savings accounts that is liquid, not tied up in any sort of asset um, that you can't get out of, but basically what type of liquid uh, assets do you have to have a rainy day fund? Um, at a minimum, this is three months of expenses. So, so take your expenses from your budget, point number one, and say, if all of a sudden, you know, my income disappeared, do I have at least three months of liquid assets that I could pull from to basically pay for three months of all of my expenses? And I say three months is a minimum. You can read and do different research on this. Um, a more robust target is actually 12 months. Um, I can tell you that me personally, I, I don't have 12 months of a rainy day fund yet. It's an aspiration that I would like to get to someday, uh, but I'm not there yet. Uh, however, I do have in my rainy day fund, you know, three months worth of my expenses. And that's very important because you don't know what's around the corner. And one of the worst places you can be in one of the just kind of disappointing or, or, or really stressful situations you can find yourself in is all of a sudden you don't have enough money to pay for the food on your table, to pay for the rent, to pay for your mortgage. 
And the best way to really mitigate that is to plan for it. So that really has to be a slice of that pie that we talked about in point one from a budget. And those are really the uh, kind of at a high level, the real key factors that you really should make sure you have all these bases well covered before you're ready to take that next step into the world of trading uh, and, and allocating funds to that. Yeah, the, the, the key takeaway here to financial readiness is, uh, because I get it, I mean, it's it's super easy to get lost in all of these things like, okay, I got to get this, I got to do this, where is all this money coming from to build this up and do this and that? The, the key to me is convince yourself why these things are important and tie it back to what you're trying to do with trading. So, for example, the rainy day fund. Um, let's say you have monthly expenses of $2,500 and, uh, you know, you go and jump ahead, skip all this stuff and jump into trading, uh, with, with $2,000 or something like that. Um, now you're not that, I guess what I'm getting at is that trading with that $2,000 or whatever is not helping, is not building the firm foundation that you should have had in place, you're trying to build, you're trying to plant trees on top of that foundation with your trading effort. You need a foundation in place to be your net, to be the fallback. Um, and if you jump ahead and you have this wad of cash, this $2,000 that you want to go start trading on the next big thing and catch a big break or whatever, convince yourself why that's not a great idea especially when it relates to like the rainy day fund of if something happens, trading takes a while. I mean, you, you can't predict when these returns are going to come in, if they're going to come in or if you're going to lose it. But what you can guarantee is if there's $2,500 of money sitting in a savings account, it's there. And when something bad happens, that's there. The trading returns or losses, that's wild rampant. You don't know what's going to happen there. Um, so the key takeaway in all of this of should I do this? Should I do this? Is you want the foundation for your garden. You want to till the, the soil to be fertile and grow good things out of it. And that's what all of these things are. And a lot of these, especially like employer matching, if there's an employer matching in your 401k, that's like, like Jeremy said, that's just free money. And so a lot of these are designed to be stable assists for wealth building. Um, and there is nothing stable in trading. Um, so get your stability on level and then you can focus on growing things out of that. Yeah. Um, you know, we're going we're gonna to touch on some of this in, in next week's episode uh, where we get into trading psychology. Uh, but really, w the reason that we lay all these things out here, you know, because it is a foundation, is one of the worst decisions, like the, the, the conditions where you make the worst decisions in trading are when you basically become paranoid um, about losing money because you're worried about its impact to other aspects of your life. And, and really building these foundations, the goal here is to take that worry away. All of this other stuff should already be taken care of so that when you step out into that trading world, into the, the world of risk and unknown, you know, what can't fill your mind is worrying that that's going to negatively impact, you know, your retirement, negatively impact the ability to put food on your table, negatively impact the ability for you to pay your mortgage. And the only way to ensure that it it's not that is to make sure separate from your trading, all of that stuff is taken care of and it's already in place. It's already in order. And, you know, it, you might look at this list and say, oh my gosh, it's going to be years before I can start trading. Are you really sure I have to do all this? And my answer to that is, yeah, I'm really sure you do. Because if you don't, you're going to put yourself in a position in your trading account someday. I don't know, may, might be right away, might be in a year from now, might be in five years from now, where that 
that worry and that dependency on the other things in your life is going to create a bad trading uh, decision and a bad trading mindset. And the easiest way to really start hammering these things out goes back to point number one. Do you have a budget? When you make your budget, consider all these other things. Consider your IRA contributions. Consider your 401k matching. Consider your college savings plans. Consider your HSA. Consider your rainy day account. And, and really having all of these things in place takes so much burden and stress and worry that you're able to focus on the things that you need to when you trade. Your, your mind is not going to be clouded um, by these other worries and these other stresses. And that's really why this is step one, uh, being financially ready to start that trading journey. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I mean, big spoiler, Lots to talk about in, in when we start to unpack that emotional uh, side of things. I mean, it's, it's real and it, it can really flip you upside down. Um, so plenty of, of stories and insight there. And so that's why this is so important to focus on because everybody hits that. I haven't talked to a single person that the emotional side of trading hasn't hit them in a pinch or whatever. And so like Jeremy said, this opens up your ability to take that and contextualize it. So certainly uh, looking forward to that discussion. So that's going to wrap up this week's episode. Um, looking forward to next week's episode of trading psychology and all of the mental games um, that, that you really go through. Uh, it can be a very stressful and, and uh, straining type of environment. It also can be super fun. Um, and that's really just trying to trading psychology. I won't get too much into that. Uh, but it, yeah, you know, watch this video again, take some notes on the points, uh, Google more about each of the topics that I talked about. Like, like I mentioned, this is really just a, a, a thing to get your mind moving, get your mind in the right place. The actual mechanics of fulfilling each of those. There's so many resources out there on the internet. Um, you know, Google around about it, educate yourself, um, feel free to drop me a DM in Discord. I'd be happy to also uh, assist you as well in any sort of questions or things like that. So that concludes part one of our four-part series. Come back next week for part two, Trading Psychology. Good luck this week. It's a shortened trading week because of the Memorial Day holiday. Uh, but have fun. Good luck. And remember, think outside the block. <laughs>